this person choosing to believe to be in New York, even though he's in Vienna, is not in possession of knowledge. He's not in, he, he doesn't he, know that he is in New York. He just thinks he is in New York, but we wouldn't speak of knowledge in that situation. Well, I mean, if he said, I believe I'm in New York versus I am in New York, I think there might be some wiggle room for him. But um, regardless of that he being- He says, I am in New York. If he says I am in New York and he's he's not, he's in Vienna. He's in Vienna. Yeah, I mean, um, you would have to ask him. Does he mean physically location? Because obviously, a, a fancy philosopher yeah. would be like, "What do you mean by New York?" He might say, "The essence of New York is in Vienna. It's crazy." So you're talking about physicality, but right? Like location. Physically in New York. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, like Bye. persuasion itself shouldn't necessarily be some like passionate telos in your view if you think that no persuasion really actually happens all you're doing is trying to find inputs that jar someone's physicality into a different direction which in the direction is you agree with me we can call it that's what persuasion is from a determinist viewer from the view that um everything we do and say and believe including argue is all just like the outcome of dominoes falling uh, of physicality for you know to put it to put it brutally is like you know it's just the consequence of material in motion matter colliding uh chemicals reacting and it would be not it would be uh, necessarily not different than a blade of grass growing or a um you know a hot springs um bubbling up from the ground it's just a consequence of nature Oh, okay, so do you think that free will is necessary to be um, to ch to change your mind, for instance, or to to be convinced of an of a certain argument? Yeah, I, free will. I think free will wouldn't even go back far enough. Free will. Free will would then necess necessitate a mind, and a mind being something that can do evaluations independent of just what's happening happening causally, physically. So, like. You can have um, a bunch of things happen in your head or brain, and then you can, if you're aware of them through sense data, you can then um, analyze them qualitatively. You could make judgments about them. But if qualitative and quantitative are the same thing from a materialist or a determinist view, why would you make the distinction between the qualitative assessment of the quantity, uh, the quantitative? Why would it even matter if the the very act of doing an analysis would also just be the, just the ball rolling, so to speak, you know, just more materialism unfolding um, determined by law. So, so if everything was determined by law, then so would beliefs. So would be, so would conclusions about philosophical qu questions or, or scientific questions. It would just be like a input output. It would just be cause reaction, cause response, cause response. Uh, I, yeah, yeah, I see what you mean, but I think if you uh, want to know what is true, um, you necessarily need to be in, in contact with reality in some way. So if you, for instance, you're looking at the screen right now and you see uh, your face and my face, you, you don't have the ability to choose not to, to see these things, for instance. You're, you're just, you're, 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 um, you're at the mercy, basically, of the, of the photons hitting your eyes. And Likewise, um, you're you you're either convinced of my argument, for instance, for free will, or you're you're not. You 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 you, you don't have this uh, additional ability of saying to yourself, it does sound convincing. Yeah, I, I think this, uh, this this guy has a point about uh, um, free will, but no, I, I I choose not to be convinced. No, it, it's not like that. You just you're you're helplessly convinced and. Of, of a proposition and, and that is with uh, that's the way with how how it goes with all of your beliefs that you have acqu acquired throughout your life i think so that that doesn't mean that it's uh, uh, life is completely uh, deterministic it, it's possible that there's still an element of randomness um but it doesn't mean it, free will like the, the the kind that you i think are in uh, belief exists that uh, i don't don't think that make makes any sense well i mean everything you described assumed that at some point in the process there was free will like for instance your desire to want to know the truth 
right, and someone's lack of desire and and whether action, the will to action could actually like, for instance, in a in a better analogy would be like there are these I don't know if you're a creative person, but if you know someone creative who's always complaining about not being inspired, right? Oh, I'm not inspired. I'm just not working. Right? I'm not inspired. And the simple thing I ask, I say to them, which I say to myself if I come up with such a terrible excuse, is I just go into action and and miraculously by by willfully acting and not knowing, uh, it causes what we call inspiration. That we there's life breathed into something that if we had not acted, so that action of will could actually fundamentally change how we experience, in that case, what inspiration feels like or should look like or shouldn't look like. And the same would be applied to your example that um, we, you and me both want the truth. That's why we're on a screen right now talking about it. And there are people who don't necessarily want that. And maybe their predisposition and, and all of their behaviors at this point um, uh, produce that outcome. But but that's not the same as whether they could change that with some will and i think what i what i argue is that they actually could they could be they could become more interested and by acting on their interests become even more interesting it's like you ever go on a water diet and you just drink water and you hate it for like a week and then there's this weird moment where you want you just want water and you can drink a lot of it and you can't you can't tell where this happens but something happens in the action of drinking water more that suddenly you can actually you desire it more. So suddenly, but that's that was a consequence of action. It just didn't like happen like it's not like you were you weren't a part of the variable of the outcome. You actually impacted the outcome with your own will, and and so the fact that that exists. Um, pointing to anyone's sort of how, how they are now or how, they're just not interested and that's just the way they are. Uh, I believe that that's true, but that's also temporary that you could actually change your your interests and your beliefs uh, by will. And so even if that means um, like, cause I do understand a part of what you're saying is that like the moment I'm convinced of something and it just occurs to me sort of like an epiphany, I didn't, choose necessarily that sure, particular that epiphany, right. Epiphany, right but so i think the, the, the example that you gave with uh, artistic creativity i think that that is totally um on, on the balance uh, for free will for uh, for uh, for the lack of free will for me at least in my mind because it just happens to you it's it, you're you're uh, you're inspired all of a sudden you don't know why or how but suddenly you, you have a tune in your head and you need to uh, put that idea to paper and uh, and then you 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 have a, a weeks where you don't you don't feel inspired at all. You don't. No, uh, but the 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 problem with your your example is that if I got a jolt of inspiration and some magnificent idea just just swelled my my brain and I was like, oh my gosh, I still have to act on it, and so I'm still left to action. So I think we're maybe talking past each other because what I'm talking about would exist on every moment to moment basis that even if I had to some an epiphany of like, uh, I just got inspired. I woke up and I jumped out of bed and I was like, I'm ready to create just being ready to create, or let's say go to the gym. It's easier for the listeners. Let's say you're just like, I'm going, you still have to will yourself to the gym, regardless of how inspired you are or how much in your head you feels like you're, you're on a new path. You still have to will yourself against your desires, against all the things nagging you into in another direction, laziness and and all this stuff. You're you're actively working against some other part of you that's still a part of your nature, and they're conflicting. They're like conflicting nat uh, parts of your nature. That's the nature to be lazy and not do it, and the nature to do it. To, to be fearful of doing it and what might happen or what people will say about you and then just doing it yeah. anyway. And, so, and I mean, sometimes the lazy part of you, you have these confl conflicting interests. Sometimes the lazy part in you wins. Sometimes the more ambitious part wins. But it's basically like if you, you use the example with going to the gym, sometimes for me, sometimes the lazy part wins, sometimes not. I don't choose when it does or when it doesn't. It, but you choose uh, to go to the gym. That I do, but but I well then who's I, well okay I, hold on hold on start take that if it's you, then it's not an it 
that precedes you, right? It's not a machine choosing to go to the gym because machines don't choose. Well, it, it doesn't. It doesn't mean that I'm a I'm a machine. I, I, we can still draw the distinction between intentional actions, so and, and uh, like accidental things. I can run over somebody uh, with my car. That's that's an that's accidental, or I can uh, do it do it purposefully because I hate that person. But but what I'm arguing for uh, is that my intentions to run over a person or to go to the gyms to the gym that is not something that I that I'm the author of fundamentally, because if you no, I, I disagree. If you have an intention to not hurt someone and you're overly aware of the road, is it likely that someone who's paying more attention to not hurting someone in that regard might avoid um, doing actually getting into that situation if you're a little more aware of it because you're you're actually willfully thinking about other people? Wait, wait, can you say that last part again? Because I said, for someone who is a willfully thinking about and considering other people, let's say in, in driving on the road, they're, they're aware, they're conscious, they're, they're actually looking actively for, for participants and to, to jump in front of the road. And they're, I'm like this too. Like I always assume, I'm going to assume that something's going to jump out of the road at some point. Like that's how I drive. Um, and I think about driving that way. And I actually think about when I stop thinking about that way. Like I'm aware of it. And I go, oh, I'm, I'm zoning out and doing this thing again where I'm like in hypnosis mode. I'm asking you, can't my – could it be that my will to be active in my engagement with the external world could produce knowingly and willfully with intent a different result than someone who just doesn't care? Definitely. I'm not saying that intentions don't matter. They, they matter tremendously in how your life is going to turn out. If you choose to be a musician, if you, um, then you're going to uh, pick up a guitar and, and practice a lot. But what I'm saying to you is that you didn't choose to be interested in music. You didn't choose to be good at music, to have, a ta to, to have discovered a ta that you have a talent in music or, or that God or uh, the universe or evolution, whatever, has equipped you with this sort of talent. Um, that, I don't. That I think I'm those. Doing. I think I would reject the premise. Like, let's say I didn't choose this moment I, where I saw someone playing and I suddenly was interested. I didn't choose the 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 my reaction to the moment. I didn't choose it. It just occurred. Right. That's what you're arguing. So someone was playing. It was probably shitty, by the way, when I was like 15. It was probably like Dave Matthews or something. And and I was like, oh, that, whatever that is, there's some thing that happens. Now, I would agree with you in that moment, you didn't choose that little spark thing that happened. That was like something beyond whatever. Uh, but the fact that I chose to pursue it, because there are a lot of people who have that thought and they, they never buy the guitar for whatever reason and they make excuses. So I'm saying that even if I granted you that first spark where we can't make sense of it, with our own will that every moment after that generated more interest so i actively generated more interest so i played more through my will and uh, and and battling my laziness i played more i then i was like oh if i'm playing more i want to learn more so i actively learned more i, I sought out now that didn't happen to me because learning actually took me uncovering theory I had to have conversations. I had to sign up with with um, guitar teachers and actually engage with them. That's different than I was walking and I heard someone playing and it just hit me in this way, right? Because I'm actively um, pursuing the knowledge of music and its theory and and learning about you know relative minors and all of the, you know all of the the Dorian scale. Um, but I would agree. I would give you half. I, it's not quite half. I'd give you what's probably equal to like 10% of the beginnings of things, which is this kind of, for the lack of a better phrase, divine spark inspiration that just occurs to us. And mm. um, and that's fine. I would grant that that does occur. Maybe in my paradigm, that's that could be God pointing and that could actually be a demon pointing you like you're inspired to do something like maybe a little off that you're like, whoa, I'm actually really interested in that weird thing that I saw at a party once. Um, now I can't stop thinking of it. Um, but I'm not going to take a, a meta ethical position right now, obviously with the time frame. but, uh, but I would give you a part of your, of your, 
position. But the other parts, as far as active activity, that suddenly the human being has faith in a vision that they see for themselves and they act on it, right? Faithfully. And, and then, and then we, when they don't act on it, certainly they don't go, well, I don't have any free will anyway. So even when I did it, I, I'm not really to uh, blame. And if I'm not to blame, I'm not to credit for anything I do. Hence, that's why this falls, if, if you take this position and we really applied it seriously, we wouldn't have a justice system. I mean, when it comes down to it. Summer was at the right place at the right time every time. I mean, he's a bad person. I totally agree with you. I wouldn't want to um, argue against him. Well, I wouldn't even know if he was a bad person. I just know that what he did, given that he had the will to do it or not do it. Um, now, the question of compulsion might be something to explore or whatever. He, like, you, you could see something where someone just, like, involuntary, ha they have to touch the guitar six times exactly, this kind of stuff. Um, I have a question for you. Given your position you would say that you're predetermined just like I was interested in music to negate free will, right? It's not some conclusion that you thought about, right? And, and given your position, I could say the right sounds out of my mouth to fundamentally have you reject that, you know, that notion and take on free will, right? Yes. Absolutely. Now would that, and that is what it's, what it means to have an open mind. I mean, if you, I think that's always a good thing. Right. To, but the question, the question, the question, the question, though, is if I had done that, let's say I said all the right sounds and you something clicked and you're like, I don't know what happened. I now reject, you know, I used to reject free will and now I accept it. If that transition happened for you, given the inputs or whatever, would you would it then be a performative contradiction if free will didn't exist? I, I don't think it would be a performative contradiction. I would just be mistaken uh, about the about the metaphysics. I, I, that is, that is the how most people. I think most people believe uh, in a sort of free will, and so that that's what right. I would just be in the same position that most people are in right now. But if you were mistaken, that means coming to the conclusion of the knowledge of being mistaken needs to be possible, right? The knowledge of of what's mistaken and what's not mistaken, like being wrong, needs a methodology so you know you have access to um, that. Oh, I was wrong about this. That that's possible, right? I'm not following you there. Okay. Sorry. So so if I said if you change your position, I asked if it would be a contradiction, and you said no, I would just be wrong. But to say from a position of no free will that there could be a correct and incorrect question, right? Or, or answer, right? Uh, it, from a position of no free will, to argue there's no free will, and to argue that there is a truth to the statement there is free will or not free will, means that there's access to, the, to knowledge, that, that there's a method that we can use to come to who's right or wrong about that statement, right? Yeah, I, I was really confused the last time when, when you made that point on P.F. Jung's stream. I, I don't understand that at all, how, how that relates to in our to our ability. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll lay it out. I, I'm, I'm position A. I say there's free will. From your position, I'm just determined to say that. Your position is there's no free will. From your position, you are determined to say that. Now, if one of us, either of us, are making a truth statement, we're already saying by making a truth statement, that there are things that are not true in the world, that, that, that even making a truth statement assumes there's a methodology for determining whether something's true or false. Do you agree? Yes, yes. Okay. Is, yeah. Now, if determinism was true and there was no free will, me making the statement that free will exists is deter from your view is determined, and you saying there is no free will is also determined, and when I go to the chat or someone in, the, in you know, who's listening and say, hey, who's right or wrong here? Whatever they do or say, whatever methodology they, they deploy, according to you, is also determined. So what methodology would you have given that any methodology would also just be a determined thing happening? And if you can't have a methodology, right, which you can't under determinism, then 
the first position that you accepted that to say there's no free will, you're already assuming there's some method to say what's true and what's false and what's and there's a method to come to the conclusions about certain things said, right? That that position A could be true or not true. And and we have a system to determine who's correct, right? Otherwise, you couldn't make a statement like there's no free will. That already assumes there's a system of determining truth claims are, are false or not, right? But the, that's why it's a problem is that nobody, you couldn't tell me the method, right? So if you said there's no free will and everything's determined, that's a truth why, claim. Why can't you have a methodology for coming to truth claims on determinism? I don't, there, there's no conflict there in my mind. Of course there is. There's, what well, is the no, conflict? The conflict, for one, is you were just determined to say that, so we don't know if that's true or not. Secondly, but, but if no, I... That, that is, I think, I don't know if Andrew would call it begging the question. I don't know if he likes using that term, but I, is it... I, I, don't, I don't agree with that already because... You were again, determined that to disagree with it, though. So how do you know if you don't agree with it? No, no, I think there, there's a fundamental, fundamental confusion here. Not what is knowledge? Knowledge is justified through belief. So, and and if I'm in a position where I'm completely uh, unhinged from reality, from I, I I I could I'm actually here in an apartment in Vienna, but I through my free will I could um, decide to believe I would I'm in New York right now. Um, that is that is exactly the opposite of justice. Uh, a justified true belief. Justified true belief. Uh, can only be formed if I'm in uh, in uh, a, a, a total uh, slave to the reality around me, and and that that is that is the case with uh, with determinism. And um, so, uh, but but I I think I have to re rewatch our our stream later because I, I you completely lost me. Okay, yeah, let's just do it one more time simply because even in your example, you're assuming that there is in fact a truth to the matter that someone could with their own free will believe that they're in New York, right? And they're not. That means that New York is in fact a place that you have knowledge of, right? That's not where this person is, right? Yeah, yeah, but 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 that what I'm what I try to illustrate with that example is that this person choosing to believe to be in New York even though he's in Vienna is not in possession of knowledge. He's not in he he doesn't he, know that he is in New York. He just thinks he is in New York, but we wouldn't speak of knowledge in that situation. Well, I mean, if he said, I believe I'm in New York versus I am in New York, I think there might be some wiggle room for him. But um, regardless of that he being... He says, I am in New York. If he says, I am in New York, and he's he's not. He's in Vienna. He's in Vienna. Yeah, I mean, um, you would have to ask him... Does he mean physically location? Because obviously a, a fancy mean, philosopher yeah. would be like, what do you mean by New York? He might say the essence of New York is in Vienna. It's crazy. So you're talking about physicality, but right? Like location. physically in New York. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, so, yeah, you would say to say that he's not, right, that he has no reason to believe he's in New York, he's completely delusional, right? Yeah. Okay. So same thing with like a dude saying I can have babies. Like I can have babies, right? <laughs> If I identify so, to be a woman. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So they're just, they're doing the same thing. They're believing they're in New York and they're not. I agree that, but that also necessitates that we have access to truth. And if, if you have a method, right, independent of just causal natural phenomenon happening in your brain, if you have a method to evaluate where someone is, um, look at a map and determine what we call Vienna, and, and so forth and go into the culture and the access to the history of Vienna and all of that. And then go to New York and be like, look at these locations. Like I could actually send people to New York, right? And you get other people involved. Well, now there's this methodology, but if you didn't, if you were determined, if everything you said and did and believed was determined, you wouldn't have justified true belief either. Why? Because the person who believes he's in New York and he's in Vienna is already just determined to believe that. And you being the one who's objecting was already determined to object. So how would you know outside of your determined physicality forcing you uh, against your own knowledge to object to this person about New York and Vienna? 
how else would you know you were correct? It, you know, if you rejected free will, you couldn't because your very methods, all of them, would be just determined mechanistic, um, as Posh would say, um, epiphenomenal. They would all be epiphenomenal, just percolating, just uh, water out of a out of a canyon, grass out of the ground. You just call it thinking, but it's really just like it's just happening. It's like it's just unfolding. I think I get now what you mean by methodology. What you mean is uh, the thing that you that happens in your mind when you uh, choose, you know, what, what Netflix movie to watch, for instance. You kind of think, yeah, maybe I watch uh, um, Sex and the City. I haven't watched that in a while. Or maybe I'm going to watch uh, The Godfather and you go back and forth, back and forth. Uh, do, no, do something, it... more, do something more truth-based. That's subjective and sort of preference-based. A preference, we could probably argue your position uh, equally. The uh, preference, we could just say, oh, no, the preference that I chose was just a result of my response and stimuli, and I just happened to choose. Let's go to determining ter determining the fact of the matter of, let's say, a logical statement or a, a mathematical statement or things like this. Well, that, I love that example because in that case, you you really don't have a choice. I mean, if you if you see if you have the uh, uh, math problem in front of you, two plus two equals. You don't have a choice but to uh, come use your use your uh, mind to come to the conclusion that it's that it's you, four. Hold on. If you hold on. if you through your free will decided no, the actual answer is five. You've you 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 uh, you and me your you and me. Is you and me both are somewhat familiar with just basic formal logic, right? Just a little bit. I think so, yeah. Okay. You and me, who are both acquainted with formal logic, still commit both informal and formal fallacies, right? Yes. Okay. So the thing is, um, our knowledge of logic and formal logic, even our knowledge, right, we still have to actually actively work and and be persuaded if you say – that's a fallacy, that's an informal fallacy, that's a formal fallacy. We go, oh, oh yeah, I, I made that mistake. I, I got to work on that. I got to catch myself on that. If what you're saying is true, that we don't have a choice, then um, making any fallacies or informal fallacies or formal fallacies um, wouldn't be important to the pursuit of truth because whatever we did as a fallacy, we shouldn't be expected to correct it even with our knowledge of formal and informal fallacies. But we don't do that, do we? You, know, knowing you, that you're a bit of a philo nerd and I'm a rudimentary wannabe a logician, um, we both now hold each other accountable, but under the assumption that you have the ability and will to change your position given honesty is a thing. Now, have you engaged with very dishonest people in their arguments? And you almost yeah, you get them in a corner, happens, yeah. you get them in a corner, and they're just like, nope. You're like you, you watch the cognitive dissonance unfold. Yeah. Have and, you ever been that person? Proof of free will for you, if somebody are just well, like that. is no, it, not it possible that they're afraid of embarrassment? That is would be free. That would be will too. They would be like, because because I've overcome embarrassment of looking stupid. I'm, maybe you have as well, where you go, you know what, be, being honorable. And admitting I'm wrong in this moment, even though I have it, I could get away with it. Actually, I can get away with um, not looking stupid, and admitting I'm I was wrong. But in the moment, the choice to admit you're wrong ends up being sort of like a a, a virtue position, not a deterministic position. Um, that we actually consider these things while we're active in life. That that should I tell them? Shouldn't I tell them? Should I tell my best friend I saw his, you know, his girlfriend with this other dude? These kind of we're we're actually pondering philosophical, uh, pondering moral moral pondering inquiry, and we're actively doing this. And um, even in the pursuit of truth, you jumping on here today to argue against free will is, in my view, and probably the large part portion of the chat, yes, I'm cheating because they already mostly agree with me is a performative contradiction that that would mean that you had no choice in the matter if i ask you chris to raise your hand right now raise your hand for me so can you raise your right hand can you raise your left hand and now both could you have said no to me 
Uh, yeah, I could have. But, but it doesn't prove anything. No, but but the fact that you could have, right, means that you have a choice in the matter that some I didn't cause you to raise your hands, right? No, I, I chose to. I mean, I, I mean, in the. I have to be precise here. If I say I could have uh, chosen not to do what you told me to, uh, I, I nobody um, forced me to. You, you did. You, you didn't have any power over me. You just asked me to, uh, uh, in, in a friendly manner. You didn't. It wasn't like a order that I had to obey. Um, but if we speak metaphysically now. Uh, I I didn't choose uh, that. I decided to, to to have to have the intention to follow what you told me. So 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 in a sense, no, I I didn't. Uh... So that would be unfalsifiable, though, right? How would you know? How would you be able to have access of whether you um, had the freedom to do it or not? If it's all post hoc, it sounds like. And I've had this position before. I, I asked someone in a debate to raise their hand who was arguing your position. And they did. And I said, could you have not done it? And he said, no, because I did it. And so that ends up being just like, it's kind of like saying like, you know, it's circular and saying like, well, I know I didn't have free will because now that it's over, I just did that. So I must have always been determined to do that because I did it. Right. And that's like not a great argument. Not that you're making that, but it sounds like it's it's almost there that you're saying, well, you know, in the end, I did do that, so therefore I must have been predetermined to do it because it happened. Is that what you're saying? I think so. I, I think that that's what I'm saying. But let me ask you a different question. Do you believe in cause and effect for the rest of the universe? I, I, what do you I, mean for the rest? So. For, 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 the rest. For, for, the, for the universe. Like a uh, uh, bowling ball hits a bunch of pins and the pins fall over. I can only and... speak for our local physics. Um, I don't have no, I, I don't even believe there's like some other locations out there that we're looking at. So, uh, it's kind of a weird question, but let's say, let's go locally. Yes. I have faith in the regularity of nature, um, that, that these things, but that doesn't mean Are I know nature. Are you part of the universe? I'm in the world, but not of it. <laughs> what do you mean? I'm in the world, I have a physical body in this reality, but me as a being, metaphysically, is not found in the world. Oh, so, so you're kind of a dualist is what, what you're saying. You, you, your mind is what you are essentially, or your soul, you would probably call it, and that is basically what has the free will. And, yeah, I would uh, say it's kind of, I would say it's a triad that, that I am mind, body, and spirit. I'm not, like, I don't have access to being without my body, but that wouldn't mean my body is identical to the other components. And at the same time, they couldn't be reduced to parts that you can separate out necessarily uh, either and put them on a scale or, or like on the table, like, a, like, they're, like they're modes, right? Like you just like take them and put them out and be like, we have a person. I think those are, they're, they're unified and they are distinct. So, that, so the mind, body, and soul are unified and distinct, but un but inseparable in the way we we experience ourselves. Like we couldn't step out of either of them to to view the other. Does that make sense? They can't be reduced. I, I think so, but I mean, how how do you explain how your mind, uh, if it really is a, a totally separate thing from your body, how does it affect your body? Um. I believe in a distinction called the noose. So it's in a, in a sense, if you believe in metaphysics, that means if you, because you said you refer to metaphysics, right? So do you accept metaphysics? Yeah, I mean, metaphysics is just like a, a subdomain of philosophy. It's yeah, like you're yeah. Asking, do you accept mathematics? I but accept I mean, do you accept it in the way that the that that you couldn't find metaphysics as material in the world, like time or like. Um, or um, uh, not like knowledge itself or truth, the, the concept, the, like these things we accept in our experience or meaning. You couldn't find meaning as physicality, right? Uh, yeah, I, th I can agree with that, I think, yeah. Yeah, okay, so then, so then metaphysics or mind, when you ask how do you think mind influences the body, I believe that the mind um, isn't physical but can impact the physical 
but how how does it do that i have no idea because because that would reduce it to to argue that here's this thing called the mind look what i look what i can do to my body you couldn't find where it did that like if you were to use your mind and your will independent of your brain to uh, to impact your brain a physicalist would have to say it was just your brain impacting the brain and that's just circular you wouldn't even need to say brain impacting brain it would just be the brain doing something whereas if you if there is a mind that's distinct but connected to our body and our mind could influence our body in some way to to actively do it you couldn't re, you couldn't actually explain how because how would then uh, assume materialism you would actually then have to reduce the mind to to cause an effect like law right but that would mean that the mind is no longer the mind it's just part of the body or like the like Dillahunty would say my 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 mind is just my brain doing stuff like that's what he would say so like then there there's no point in saying the mind but if you think there's a mind and I think there's a mind, and we both agree it can't be grounded or, or isolated as physicality, including in our brain. And along with that meaning, information, um, the laws of logic, numbers, geometry, um, truth, these things are not found anywhere as physical objects or matter or atoms, yet we appeal to them constantly. And, and, it, and it would be absurd for us to go, well, you appeal to them now put them in a beaker right? we we just couldn't we just couldn't do it definitionally we couldn't do it okay but that but to say that they have some sort of interaction uh, to argue they don't would be a contradiction yeah cuz you'd uh, be you'd be engaged you don't know, understand like if i were to argue they these things out here these universal concepts and the laws of logic and the mind have no impact on anything mm -hmm. you're already engaging with them so I, I know what you mean yeah I, i've heard that argument before at the retort to materialism you know of course it's basically like yeah logical concepts exist uh, numbers exist and they can affect how you think how you move um so uh but what i would just say to that is is these these abstract concepts they they are not causally effective um, at, at the at the conceptual level. It, they fundamentally they 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 are it, where yeah they concepts are concepts don't is at the level of the brain. So, yeah, con so concepts don't cause things. You know, like so metaphysical objects, like the concept of a, a universal concept of a square. Uh, same thing with numbers. Numbers have no causal. They're causally a feat. And that means that even further uh, supports my position that the mind has access and utilizes concepts, the conceptual realm, which is not found in nature. But, to, but there are concepts to, that I, 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 you would surely grant uh, are not uh, causally a feat, that they would uh, cause you to get up and move. For, for instance, if I told you... Uh, yeah, there, there's a ring of child raping cannibals uh, in in your basement right now. That uh, you know, what are you going to do about it? That's a concept, and I think no, it's going to no, be that would be effective. That, because, you no, know, that would that would inf no, I would no, that would inform. I think saying cause is a huge leap. I think it, well, I, I more... think there, there's a there's a continuum between there's no fine line between this sort of concept and uh, the the concept of well, prime numbers. It, it's easy to debunk. Is if there's two people and you told them the same thing and it was true for both people, and one didn't move and one did move or one fought and one didn't fight, then then obviously it's not the concept that causes X behavior because it produces. Yeah, but two if separate... you remove the concept, then neither of them would would have moved. So then I think you can reasonably assume that it, the concept no, plus it, maybe it, the additional motivation of, uh, is what caused I would say I would say it informs them, but it doesn't cause them. They have to act independent of the, of the, of the concept. If what you're saying is true, then all you, you can just control people by just saying concepts. That, that is true. You can't control uh, people by saying no. concepts. I don't think you can prove. I don't think there's any way Depends you can actually demonstrate. Depends on what kind of concepts they are. It is, but they are, but... Uh, no, yeah. you could, you could, I think it's, it's more accurate to say that you can present narratives to people and you could produce 
uh, predictable behaviors uh, given that they accept the narrative. I mean, look at the last three years. Um, but I wouldn't say it's causal. I would say it's called, it's like nudging. So it's influential um, at most. And I believe I've seen that in real time. In You could nudge people. Um, uh, damn. Oh, the, you should watch this movie called The Push, actually. Um, it's a documentary of this guy who's into how psychology and how people react to social pressures. And he did this documentary where he got these people to nudge them to do pretty horrific things um, that they thought were really happening, but they weren't. Um, and that was a form, and he really did make the distinction that people do have the will to say no. It's just that in certain circumstances, they say yes. For instance, there's a there's this um, experiment where there's a guy in front in front of the room, and he shows one line and and a, a longer line. You know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, I think I heard about. And he can, yeah, he convinces the the whole group to um, he convinces the whole group to say basically that the lines were even, even though they were completely observably not. And yeah. you wouldn't say that the concept of the lines caused them uh, to reject their own reasoning. But you would say that the social pressure that somehow was enveloped in the room created a condition that allowed them to be maybe be more partial to to questioning their own reasoning, like that they they were like, oh my gosh. Now I think you're using causal, like sort of in a colloquial sense, and I would grant it in that sense. I would not grant it that X causes this, like it just it like sets the stage for a number of likely responses let's say and the response is you still have the willpower otherwise again we're back to the legal problem like suddenly there's no um ju there's no justice there i mean like i had a meme once that just the guy you know the guy in the jumps in the orange jumpsuit standing he's waiting for the verdict and the the guy in the suit the lawyer one last time is telling the judge he says but your honor uh there is no free will like it just demonstrates the absurdity that what that that we can't make choices otherwise in the matters of truth or our behavior and not only is that as the most powerless position um it it's the most self-refuting position because anything you do or say after that um or anyone else does there's no point in arguing about it i mean certainly there's no point in pursuing truth or justice or um or anything like that because it's just all a giant machine, and we're just cogs that sometimes get locked up with each other until something's forced to break, I, I, I guess. It's super nihilistic. I mean, I don't know what your age is, Chris, but 27. I'm going to— Yeah, I'm going to—okay, 27. I'm going to give you about five more years. Hopefully, you become a father, and um, if you're following well, me, I hope you are. To reason. No, yeah, I hope, I hope that— in five years, I, I I get that's a that's a big amount of time. I'm you know granting you five years to to really fully exhaust this position, um, but <laughs> if you're here in five years, I'm gonna be so much more meaner to you. <laughs> Why though? Oh, you, you're saying you're you're you were lenient on me because of my age. Otherwise, you would have crushed me right now. No, I no, I'm I'm being facetious and and but but I do. Like if you're like you're not growing a family, or you're not suddenly responsible for more people like you look at a child who's like, you know, looking up to you and asking you for guidance. The idea that their behavior and your behavior and whatever you say is just determined and it do ultimately doesn't really matter what you say to them. You can tell them that, like, there's nothing wrong with killing anybody or whatever. You, you might go to jail, but there's nothing actually wrong with anything. And if you were to if you were to give your view now, you're like a nicer version of this. But there are people who take your position who really don't give a shit about anything I that really happens. I would like to meet these people that have this. That don't uh, give a shit. Oh no, man, I mean, you go. That don't, don't give a shit based on this sort of philosophical it's, view. Well, it's nihilism. It's epistemic nihilism. Okay, maybe. Yeah. But yeah. no, I, I mean, I wouldn't teach my children to not give a shit or not be kind to, to but if you were life. determined to you wouldn't no one could blame you right again i mean we we already went over this but yeah yeah i mean i i get what you're saying yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. cool all right well um i'm gonna jump two more uh it's 320 
Yeah, I'm gonna have to close this out. I'm well, way thanks over. Thanks for having me. Hopefully hey, no problem. We'll do this again. Sometime. Yeah, yeah. Jump on any. Jump on any time. Sometimes when it's actually a full panel about something else, um, it'll, it'll be fun with different topics as well. Cool. Great. Thanks a lot, Chris. Appreciate you. Mm -hmm.